Um, OK, so the final uh, segment today is to introduce spray modeling. Uh, we're going to be talking tomorrow about engines that utilize liquid sprays, including diesel combustion. And so this is a big topic for internal combustion engine research. So just like we were talking about uh, for laminar flames, we have similar types of questions about sprays. If you look at a diesel engine, or even a gasoline uh, direct injected engine, you find that the spray droplets are very small, 10 microns being a typical droplet size. So if you wanted a finite difference mesh in your simulation, your CFD simulation, uh, that could include uh, dimensions down to 10 microns, you would need 10 to the 4 grids in a 10 centimeter bore engine in one dimension. In three dimensions, that becomes 10 to the 12, which is just totally beyond today's computer capacity. Uh, maybe you can do several, um, certainly a million, maybe 10, maybe even 100 million, but 10 to the 12 is totally out of the question. So that means that engineering models will not be entirely predictive for decades, probably, maybe ever. And accurate submodels will be needed for detailed processes down to the level of droplets in a combustion calculation. What are the kinds of processes that are involved? Well, droplets suffer drag. That's how momentum is transferred between the injected liquid and the surrounding uh, gas. Drop turbulence interactions, vaporization, atomization, breakup. Droplets collide, they coalesce, uh, they hit walls. So all of these processes are pr processes that need to be modeled. All right, so <clears throat> I want to review what's available in the literature for modeling sprays. So first of all, we already discussed the gas phase uh, equations. Now we're going to talk about the liquid phase. And once again, turbulence is going to be important. And the models that are, say, the predominant models these days for engine simulation are called LDEF models, or Lagrangian drop Eulerian fluid models. The idea here is that it's a two-phase flow. You have liquid in the form of droplets uh, in your simulation. Uh, that is, uh, of course, working together with the gas phase, which is treated using Eulerian approach. The Lagrangian approach is you follow the mo motion of these individual particles. You see them as sources of mass, momentum, and energy, which then enter into the gas phase equations. So if you look at, it, at an injection process, typical injector for a diesel engine is around 100 micron in diameter. The computational cell in a realistic computation is around a millimeter. So we're off by a factor of 10. So a lot of the process that occurs uh, is occurring inside the grid. In other words, you're not resolving it. It's a sub-grid scale process. And if you look at the spray, uh, it, the liquid that's being injected is going to be breaking up into droplets. Um, <clears throat> how do you handle a problem like that? Well, one approach that's uh, used in the LDF approach uh, models is to introduce a distribution function. Instead of trying to track every single droplet, one introduces a distribution or probability function, a function of position. There's three uh, coordinates here, x, y, and z. A function of the velocity of the particle. There's three coordinates there, so that's six total. The size of the particles, you'll have a probability distribution in size, so that's seven. And then you might have other parameters, such as the droplet temperature. So this uh, function, this probability density function, uh, is a function of six, seven, eight, and then time, nine independent variables. Uh, and you'd like to have the, uh, that function available so that you can characterize the, uh, the two-phase flow. For example, you might be interested in calculating the gas void fraction. Uh, how much of the cell is occupied by gas and how much is occupied by liquid? Well, if I have the distribution function in terms of these independent variables, size, velocity, temperature, and the, uh, the volume of interest, I can integrate over the probability distribution function and calculate the void fraction. So if there are no droplets, the void fraction is 1, right? Because f is 0 then. 
Current models assume that the droplets occupy no volume. In other words, this is an assumption that the void fraction basically is very close to one. Uh, this is actually not a bad assumption, especially if you have a computational cell that's large compared to, say, the uh, dimensions of the, of the liquid that uh, is contained in that cell. Uh, there are uh, CFD code vendors and so on who now say, well, we're going to use adaptive mesh refinement and we're going to refine the mesh down to order of the injected diameter. And they violate this assumption. This is unfortunate because the equations that they solve still make this assumption. And that's something that's uh, an uncertainty in, in many codes that you can find these days. The other fact uh, that makes computations difficult is that in a typical spray, as I'll show you on the next slide, you have many, many droplets. So to track each of those droplets is, again, uh, very difficult. And that's where the idea of grouping together the droplets in parcels makes a lot of sense. This was introduced by John Dukovitz in the 80s and basically made it possible to now do simulations of sprays. So his idea is the following. <laughs> I inject my liquid. I've got many, many droplets. But instead of trying to track every single droplet, I'm going to group them together in what are called parcels of, in each parcel, the same size drop that has the same velocity and the same temperature and so on. And it will just be appearing here as just a, as one parameter that I, that I keep track of. So for example, if I look at a diesel, if I inject 160 uh, milligrams of fuel, and I know the typical drop size, 10 micron, I can calculate how many drops that is going to correspond to, and I get 70 million drops that are going to be participating in that injection. Way too many to track. So if I instead consider these parcels of 100 or 1,000 droplets that are statistically representing my overall spray, I can reduce this down to a simulation involving thousands of particles instead of millions. And rely on statistics to say that that's going to be similar to the original spray. So that's uh, the approach of drop parcels. Now, how do you actually track the evolution of this probability density function? This is now, I've written it in terms of two additional variables, the drop distortion parameter and its rate of change. Droplets are not all spherical, right? Some of them are distorted. So uh, uh, the conservation equation uh, basically is a hyperbolic equation shown here. The evolution of the distribution function with time is due to uh, evolution in physical space due to the velocity of the particle. Evolution in velocity space due to drag forces uh, on, the, on the particle. I need to specify this somehow, and that's where a model comes in. Due to changes in the droplet radius, due to vaporization and heating, so all of these affect the distribution function. Due to changes in the droplet temperature, due to heating, due to droplet distortion, and the distortion, the rate of distortion. And then I have source terms, which will change the distribution function with collision and coalescence. Uh, two droplets collide. I reduce the number of droplets in the probability function. And I also change the size of the drop that's formed in the coalescence process and the breakup similarly. So I need models for drag, vaporization, heating, drop distortion, drop collision, coalescence, and breakup. If I have all of those models, I can solve this equation. It's in a nine-dimensional space. Uh, which is a real challenge. <laughs> so I will show you how the actual solution procedure uh, takes place. But once I have the distribution function, I can then calculate the source terms in the momentum and energy equations for the gas phase. For example, the drag forces on the droplets, this F term here, uh, times the, the probability of droplets of certain size contributing, is going to be the way that momentum is transferred from the injected liquid to the gas, right? Similarly, we have the Stefan flow part here where the radius change causes vapor to leave the droplets at uh, uh, velocity. 
And that then is um, a source of momentum that's transferred to the gas phase. Similarly, for the energy equation, you see here that the droplet internal energy plus its kinetic energy uh, is also going to be imparted to the gas phase as the droplet radius changes due to vaporization. The vapor leaving the droplet is going to uh, add energy to the gas phase. Uh, here you have energy stolen from the gas phase generally because the droplet temperature uh, changes due to vaporization processes. Uh, so you can have cooling uh, there. And similarly, there's work terms. Because of the drag uh, operating uh, over a distance, uh, the drag force operating over a distance, you have a, um, a work term. You'll also see in the turbulence model work done by drag forces. Again, uh, it appears in the turbulence model. The whole point, though, is that until I can specify this function, this distribution function, and drive it by means of models for drag, vaporization, uh, droplet heat up, and so on, I'm going to uh, not be able to solve the spray problem. So how do I actually solve this complicated hyperbolic equation? Well, I use the same method that we discussed earlier on, the method of characteristics. You can show that that uh, hyperbolic equation is equivalent to a, character, a set of characteristic equations that I've listed here. For example, the droplet position changes with time according to the droplet velocity. So here I am in a computational cell, one of these cells here, and here's my droplet. It's moving at velocity v. It's encountering turbulence length scale eddies of L and turbulent fluctuation velocities of U prime. I want to advance the time to the next time level. Uh, how do I do that? I solve this ordinary dif differential equation. Knowing the velocity of the particle, I can calculate the new position of the particle. Remember that this is not just a particle. It's an assemblage or a parcel full of droplets that have all, each droplet has the same a value of temperature, position, velocity, and so on. And so I'm using a statistical trick to represent many, many droplets. Of course, during this process, I'm also going to have breakup occurring and maybe generate new droplets. That's going to come, as I'll show you in a minute, from a source term. Well, how does the velocity change during this process? Well, that's going to be driven by the drag force. Uh, this is just essential drag, drag force per unit mass, right? This is F equals MA. Uh, and then the droplet size is going to be driven by the vaporization model. Uh, it could actually even be an increase if I have a, a condensation process. So this is the way you actually solve that uh, equation, the spray equation. The turbulence model provides parameters that are needed for some of the models, length scales and the turbulence kinetic energy. And the spray submodels provide expressions for the drag, the vaporization, the collision, the breakup. And then, of course, to start everything off, you need at the injector here maybe uh, the initial velocity, the initial size of the particles, the initial temperature. And that comes from an atomization model. So lots of models. OK, so let's look at them in a little bit more detail. How do they com contribute then to the gas phase? So now we're looking at the Eulerian gas phase equations. Uh, the equations that you would have in the absence of a spray, right, would be the, the mass conservation, the rate of change of density, the uh, divergence term involving the uh, flux of mass. And then on the right-hand side, you have a potential source term now because with corresponding to the distribution function, and the rate of radius change due to vaporization, you have mass being added to the computational cell of interest. So this is a source term. Uh, of course, you want to keep track of if, if this is uh, fuel vapor, you'll have to then solve this equation for the, the, uh, the rate of change of fuel vapor concentration, for example. For momentum equation, we have a similar uh, contribution due to the spray, and that's this uh, momentum, momentum exchange term that I mentioned due to the drag forces on the droplets. So it's a source term in the momentum equation. The other terms we've already seen, right? We have pressure gradient terms, we have uh, vis viscous uh, terms, and uh, uh, turbulent transport terms, um, as shown here. <laughs> 
If we look at the energy equation, we have, we've seen this equation before. The new thing to look at now is the contribution from the spray. So this would be energy associated with the vaporizing droplets. Right? We either have depletion as they steal energy from the gas to vaporize, or if they condense, they give energy back to the gas. Uh, we already discussed combustion earlier, and here's our turbulence term. So we've discussed all these other terms. This last one is the one due to the spray. And then other terms uh, involve uh, heat flux over here uh, due to thermal gradients and uh, the uh, enthalpy uh, transport due to species. The equations are then closed with the equation of state and the turbulence model equations. And we've seen these already. Uh, the only new term here is this one here, where we are adding to the turbulence kinetic energy from the droplet source term. Uh, basically, we have uh, a, a work term that involves a distance per unit time times the forces that are um, associated with drag. And that same term also appears in the dissipation rate equation. So the turbulence is, affecting the, is being affected also by the spray, the spray droplets. That affects the turbulent diffusivity, the length scale of the turbulence eddies, and also the turbulence intensity or fluctuating velocities. So at the Engine Research Center, we've kind of put all of these things together to create as a, the ability to model sprays. And one of the uh, things that we did early on was to say, well, how are you going to inject this liquid? We have introduced a concept we call the blob injection model. So instead of trying to have a continuous liquid injected into the domain and track that continuous liquid, which, by the way, we've also done, but this, in this modeling approach, we bypass that. We say we're injecting these blobs of liquid that have diameters that correspond somehow to the uh, nozzle diameter. Um, and that these uh, blobs then break up due to processes that involve uh, interaction with the ambient gas. For example, the Kelvin Helmholtz uh, instability model that I'll be telling you about that leads to instabilities on the surface of these blobs that eventually uh, form droplets. And then beyond a certain length, which we can also estimate, droplets encounter the gas phase and they decelerate. So the tremendous deceleration forces, thousands of, of Gs that these droplets experience in a diesel spray. And that leads to Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities, which we can then also track. So that's uh, how we would model a spray. We first look at the nozzle flow. Uh, we have dimensions of the nozzle, its inlet radius of curvature, the length to diameter, the passage. We have the atomization model that produces the initial droplets from the blobs. Uh, we then have breakup and collision coalescence. We have droplet drag, fuel vaporization, spray wall impingement. And here's a picture of a simulation where you see the velocity vectors associated with that uh, injected spray, uh, the droplets impinging on a piston in, in a simulation that just looked at one spray uh, in an engine. OK, so let's look at first the nozzle cavitation. Um, here's a typical injector nozzle. You have a needle which lifts, and then pressurized liquid is squirted through these holes. Uh, we can do simulations of this. Uh, if you look carefully, you'll see the needle moving over here, flow passing through uh, the uh, sac region here of the injector, uh, and then through the injector passage. You have separation of the flow from surfaces leading to cavitation. Um, what, uh, these colors here are for density, so the blue regions have <coughs> relatively low density. Um, but in any case, with a simulation like this, you can estimate the velocity of the fluid, average velocity across the cross-section of the, of the nozzle at the exit, and also uh, details about the density uh, of the flow. Um, of course, these can also be obtained from measurements. So in many cases, in simulations, instead of doing a very expensive calculation like this, you might want to just use measured uh, velocities uh, or estimated velocities. So that's what this uh, approach describes. 
So here we have an injector nozzle uh, with a certain inlet radius uh, curvature. This is very important because it turns out that one can design nozzles that avoid cavitation altogether. What is the purpose of cavitation? Well, cavitation uh, essentially is a way of equilibrating the pressure field. Uh, and it's sometimes uh, undesirable because uh, it disturbs the flow significantly. So here at station two, we have the pressure in the combustion chamber, which we assume is known. Here at station one, we have the pressure in the reservoir upstream of the nozzle. And uh, we compare those two pressures and determine whether they are greater than a certain parameter that is related to what's called the contraction coefficient. And the contraction coefficient comes from experimental measurements, and here's a plot of this contraction coefficient versus the radius uh, to diameter ratio of the entrance to the hole. So you can see that uh, under certain conditions, you're gonna have cavitation, namely if the, um, uh, if the ratio of the pressures uh, is uh, greater than this parameter, you have cavitating flow, less than you have non-cavitating flow. Non-cavitating flow, essentially you would have flow that fills the nozzle passage completely. So that's shown here. Uh, for non-cavitating flow, the discharge coefficient uh, is determined based on the length of the length to diameter ratio of the passage. And the effective velocity of injection is determined by Bernoulli's equation, the pressure difference across the nozzle times the discharge coefficient which we obtain over here. The effective area at the exit of the nozzle is the nozzle area. Um, and so the initial diameter of the blob is such that it would uh, fill the entire cross section of the nozzle. If we have cavitating flow, now we have to worry about that contraction coefficient we also worry about the vapor pressure of the fuel in that case. Um, and now the uh, effective injection velocity and effective cross-sectional area is different. In fact, we don't run full. There's areas of the nozzle that are occupied by vapor. And so there's a change in the size of the blob that we inject into the computational domain. So that's a simple, practical uh, cavitation modeling approach that gives you a, at least a way to start. I should mention that a lot of people are doing very high resolution simulations of the injection process uh, and are predicting some of these parameters and uh, checking against these correlations. Okay, so once we've injected the liquid, it's gonna break up into droplets. And the breakup process, very complicated, uh, but one can identify various regimes of breakup. So here is a low pressure injection uh, into a low gas pressure environment, kind of like your slowly dripping faucet in the kitchen, right? And you see the liquid stream break up into large droplets. It's called the Rayleigh breakup regime. As you increase the gas pressure here, these uh, surface disturbances that lead to the droplets become augmented by aerodynamic effects. So you'll start to see lower pressure on the surface of these waves leading to faster growth. And as you, it's called the first wind-induced regime. And then as you continue to increase the ambient gas pressure or density really, you enter a regime where now the breakup is due to very short wavelength waves. And finally, with sufficiently high uh, gas density, the breakup starts right at the exit of the nozzle. You don't see any clear liquid stream at least uh, n not very easily. So the regime of most interest is this atomization regime, and that's the one I want to talk about next. So here are some pictures showing a liquid jet emerging uh, to the right, and uh, the nozzle exit is right here. And you can see these little waves uh, appearing on the surface of the jet, which eventually lead to droplets. Um, so we've had a lot of success modeling this type of process using a linearized stability analysis where essentially you look at the equations that govern the liquid flow here and you perturb the surface with a surface wave of height eta uh, 
which is equal to an initial disturbance height and then a wave number k and a wave growth rate omega. And what you'd like to do is relate the wave growth uh, rate omega to the wavelength of the waves. So which wavelength here is going to be the most unstable? And that's going to be the one that we assume leads to the breakup of the jet. This is the kelvin Helmholtz jet breakup model. So here's kind of a, a picture of that. <laughs> we have these waves growing on the surface of our blob here. Uh, we, uh, surface waves, I say, are characterized by this uh, exponential growth function. Uh, what we do is we write down the equations of continuity for the liquid phase. We assume the gas phase uh, is typically a flat profile, although that is not really a necessary assumption, but it can, can be relaxed. So here we look at the equations in the gas phase for momentum in the axial direction and the equation in the radial direction for the radial component. Um, okay, here I said we assume the gas profile is linear or is constant. Uh, and then we find, uh, if we look at the gas equations, we can get an equation for the pressure at the surface, which involves the density of the gas, that's rho sub 2, the velocity of the jet, which is u, the growth rate, omega, and the wavelength, and this whole thing squared. The height of the waves, uh, again, the wave number appears here, and then Bessel functions. There are boundary conditions that need to be accounted for. Uh, and this one is really important. This is the normal stress boundary condition, which shows that the pressure in the liquid plus the normal stress due to viscosity, this is a viscous term here, plus the term that involves surface tension, those are the normal forces on the jet, are balanced by the pressure force in the gas. And when you do all of this, the math associated with that, you get this equation here, which is called a dispersion relationship, which relates the growth rate of these waves to their wavelength uh, or wave number, which is 2 pi over the wavelength. Uh, there's Bessel functions because it's a circular jet. And so on this term here is the viscous term. Here's your surface tension term. And here's the term involving the gas density and relative velocity squared. So one can take this equation and plot it. And here I'm plotting the great wave growth rate normalized by uh, the density of the liquid, the, the radius of the jet, and surface tension uh, against the wavelength of the wave normalized by the jet radius, I guess. That's what A is. And what you see is you get results that show a peak in the wave growth rate at a certain wavelength. And this curve depends on two parameters, the Weber number, which basically is this term over here, the gas density times the velocity squared, that's over here, times the radius divided by the surface tension. So it measures essentially uh, inertia forces to surface tension forces. So if you have low uh, inertia forces compared to surface tension forces, you have low growth rate and also the wavelength moves to larger wavelengths. The other term in the equation is the Onsorger number, which measures uh, viscous forces to surface tension forces. So if you have an inviscid uh, jet, in other words, a low viscosity fluid, you would get this curve here for a Weber number of 30. Whereas if you have a viscous jet, you see significant reduction in the peak growth rate and also an increase in the most unstable wavelength. So the peak values of the growth rate and wavelength are given by uh, capital omega and capital lambda, and they are used then in the breakup model. Um, these are just some curve fits of those curves that you just saw there that uh, are useful for using in the computer. Uh, you can see the parameters involve the Ansorger number, Taylor's number here, which involves the Ansoga number and the Weber number. Here are the definitions of the Weber numbers and the Reynolds number. It's a fluid mechanics problem, right? Uh, and this just summarizes those peak uh, wave, uh, wavelength and growth rates as a function of Weber numbers and so on. Okay, so how do you use that in the model? 
The idea is that you have this wave growing on the surface of this injected liquid jet. Uh, it grows in magnitude due because it's an unstable configuration. Uh, the instability leads to the growth of the wave. And at some point, the wave converts into a droplet. And that's a nonlinear process that's not handled by the model. But we make the assumption that the size or radius of this droplet is somehow proportional to this wavelength. Makes a lot of sense because that's how much liquid would be in that particular wave. So we have a constant here that we have to tune. Uh, <coughs> during the growth of this wave, you have both a vertical component of velocity and, of course, the jet is moving uh, at velocity capital U. Uh, and in, in this case, then, you see that you could predict an angle with which the droplet is ejected. And this is used to predict the spray angle, the velocity, the radial velocity divided by the axial velocity. And you can show that that's basically the density ratio, square root, times a function, where this function is a function of the Taylor number. You can also predict the length of the, of the core of the jet. In other words, how long it takes to convert the injected liquid into droplets. Because I know how much mass is associated with each droplet that is formed. And if you do that calculation, you find the length of the jet is proportional to the radius of the jet, the density ratio, the liquid to gas density ratio, divided by this Taylor function, uh, which is just shown in the plot here. Most of the calculations of interest occur at high values of the Taylor number, so F here is usually just a constant. Okay, so once you have the droplets, <coughs> they're injected, they now break up, uh, or can break up, depending on uh, the parameters. And there are many different droplet breakup regimes. So for instance, at low Weber numbers, remember Weber number was the ratio of inertia forces to surface tension forces, so at low, uh, and, and also includes the gas density, at low values of gas density, for instance, uh, the droplet just distorts. A circular droplet deforms to form a disk. However, uh, as you increase the Weber number, that increase the inertia forces, the droplet can break up into various uh, conceptualized modes. And there's been many people that have done research over the years on different regimes of breakup. Uh, so I just summarize that here. Um, some people have argued that breakup is due to capillary surface waves, kind of like the KH model uh, that we just discussed. Others talk about boundary layers. Um, we've uh, found that for high-speed jets, uh, a different regime occurs that involves the, the distortion of the droplet. And I just want to show an experiment that we did that shows this. So we devised an experiment where we injected a monodisperse, and means all of the same diameter, droplet stream into a high-velocity air jet. And we took double pulse images, so you can see the droplet here and then faint outline of the droplet uh, at an earlier time on the same image. So double pulse uh, light source. And what we found is that the droplets that encounter the air jet flatten and it, we can identify waves that grow on the surface of this flattened uh, droplet. And the wavelength of those waves corresponds to Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities. And that's, again, from a theory that looks at an accelerating mass and the instability of an accelerating mass. So here's the acceleration. And it depends on the density difference between the liquid and the gas and the surface tension. So from the Rayleigh-Taylor theory, we can predict a wave growth rate and also a wavelength, uh, capital lambda. Now, once these waves are uh, serve to d disintegrate the liquid into chunks, we think that the KH model, the Kelvin-Helmholtz breakup model, now starts to play a role and basically creates these streams of droplets that you see from the breakup of the parent droplet here. OK, so that's used in uh, the KH breakup model to handle droplet breakup. Now, once you have those droplets that are uh, formed from the atomization and breakup process, they can collide with one another and coalesce. 
So how do you deal with that? Well, uh, O'Rourke's model is the one that's widely used. Essentially, O'Rourke calculates a collision frequency between droplets in two parcels, parcel one and parcel two. And the droplet collision frequency depends on the number of droplets in, in this case, parcel two, the cross-sectional uh, collision area, uh, which means you need to know the radius of the drops in parcel one. Remember, they're all the same radius, and all the uh, drops in parcel two have the same radius, R2. A collision efficiency term, which basically uh, is of order one, uh, so we don't have to get into that in much detail. And then uh, the relative velocity between the two parcels. So how is this used? Well, you assume that the collision process is a Poisson process. You, uh, you choose a random number between 0 and 1. right? It's a random uh, collision process. And we've got our collision frequency here. Uh, we calculate the number of collisions that are predicted to take place between parcels in N2 parcels in parcel 2, sorry, N2 droplets in parcel 2 and N1 uh, droplets in parcel 1. So that's, a, again, a statistical approach at calculating collision frequencies. Comes from the kinetic theory, right? If you look at the kinetic theory of collisions of molecules, you'll have a very similar looking equation. Okay, so once they collide, what happens to them? What's the outcome of the collision? Well, this plot here summarizes a lot of physics. Basically, I have small droplets colliding with big droplets at a point here. There's a thing called the collision impact parameter, which determines essentially whether you have a head-on collision versus a grazing collision. Uh, in other words, they just uh, move past each other. So for head-on collisions, the impact parameter is one here. And typically, you'll see the droplets uh, bounce apart. Uh, this is the Weber number, uh, as defined here, based on the liquid density, the velocity, uh, the uh, component of velocity for the two, co two colliding droplets, the, seen from the vector diagram here, the smaller droplet diameters, and the surface tension. And here's our non-dimensional impact parameter. And the ratio of the droplet sizes is also a parameter in the models. So experimental data is shown by the symbols here. You have bouncing droplets. You have stretching separation, where droplets will essentially collide and then separate apart. And then the green ones here are droplets that actually collide and coalesce and form a new bigger droplet. Uh, and then down here, you have separation, where the droplets will just slide past each other. Um, the solid lines are the models that we use. And you can find details of those models in, in these references. So we've now handled droplet breakup and droplet collision and coalescence. Uh, I, or I should just mention that experiments such as these are used to uh, validate these models, where you have streams of droplets colliding and breaking up. Droplet drag. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, when a droplet is uh, injected, into a high gas density environment, it slows down tremendous. There's tremendous deceleration. And in the process, it gives up its energy to the gas. That's the droplet drag that we're interested in. So this is our F equals MA equation. F here is the force per unit mass. right? And you can see that droplet drag, if you look in a, your uh, fluid mechanics textbook, is very complicated. It involves the viscosity of the gas, it involves what's called the added mass, where you now have to get the gas that used to be occupying the space where the droplet is. You have to get that moving at velocity of the droplet. So that's, uh, but fortunately, this parameter is small for us because the gas density is much less than the droplet density generally. And then you have a history term, the so-called Bassett history term, which makes the entire history of the motion of the droplet important in calculating the current drag. Fortunately, this term is, again, small, so we can ignore it. And in fact, what you'll generally see is instead a correlation that says the mass of the droplet, its volume times its liquid density, times its acceleration is given by a formula that involves the 
uh, inertia force, the gas density, the velocity of the droplet squared, divided by two. Uh, this is the relative velocity between the drop and the gas. The frontal area of the droplet is appearing here. So if it's a circular drop, well, we know what that is. But if it's a distorting drop, we have to account for that. I'll talk about that in a second. And then we have a droplet uh, drag coefficient. And that's uh, typically a function of the Reynolds number. And then this is a vector equation. The, director, the direction of change is, again, uh, determined by the, uh, the relative velocity between the drop and the gas. So the distortion of the droplet uh, is mon monitored with a parameter called y, which is 0 when we have a spherical drop, and it's equal to 1 when we have a flat disk. And we change the drag coefficient calculated up here uh, to account for the change in shape of the droplet. And we also account for the change in surface area uh, during this distortion. And how is that modeled? Well, it uses the uh, TAB model. Again, it's from Los Alamos National Lab, uh, which basically looks at the oscillation of a sphere that's subject to forces due to kinetic forces uh, due to uh, the, surface, uh, the uh, relative motion. Uh, surface tension forces and viscous forces. So we solve this ordinary differential equation for each droplet parcel to find the value of the distortion and then use that to calculate the drag coefficient. Okay, so that's the spray models. And uh, the bad news is that the results show that the spray models are extremely mesh dependent. So I'm showing you here some results where we predict the injection of a, a liquid um, into a combustion chamber, where the mesh size ranges from four millimeters to a quarter of a millimeter. And I'm showing results all at the same time after the beginning of injection. And you see that on the coarse mesh, I have much less penetration of the jet into the chamber than on the fine mesh. The reason for this is that the droplet drag on the coarse mesh is overpredicted. You see that the liquid here occupies only a tiny part of the cell. So you have to, you have to basically accelerate all of the fluid in that computational cell, uh, which requires much more effort than you do in these cells here, which are much smaller, right? The liquid can interact with the gas cells much more effectively in a, a fine mesh than in a coarse mesh. Not only that, but we also have the problem that the droplet collision and coalescence processes are different because in a coarse cell, there are much fewer droplets in a cell than in a fine uh, computational mesh. So we've had to develop some kind of uh, fix for this. One fix, one fix would be what I mentioned earlier, only run on very fine meshes, but there's a problem then I have to solve some different equations because the equations assume the liquid does not fill, it occupies zero of the volume of the cell. So if I get down to very fine meshes here where the liquid now fills the cells, I have to solve different equations. I have to solve equations for the liquid phase and gas phase coupled, which is quite different and much more difficult problem to solve. So engineering solution. Engineering solution is to say, when I inject the liquid, I'm going to entrain gas into the, the spray. And effectively, I'm going to see a spray that looks a lot like a gas jet that would have formed if I had injected fluid gas with the same momentum as I injected uh, my liquid jet. So what I will do is I'll go to the theory of gas jets, and I will use, instead of the calculated um, gas velocities from my CFD, I will use a model, which is a gas jet model for gas being injected into a chamber, which is available, and uh, it's an analytical model. So when I do that, this is the result. I only apply this correction to the cells right here at the nozzle, near the nozzle exit, before the liquid starts to uh, spread out uh, into a spray, because this is the region where I have the problem of the coarse mesh 
over predicting the drag. If I use the uh, gas jet model as a subgrid momentum exchange near the nozzle, I find I can get the same penetration, uh, same spray structure, independent of the mesh size. It's only what happens right at the nozzle that's the concern. So this, I think, was a really helpful discovery because it allows us now to uh, perform spray calculations uh, on even coarse meshes, which are, of course, uh, economical. OK, so to finish up, uh, just a couple of other things. Droplet vaporization. So we have these droplets. They're breaking up. They're colliding, coalescing. And we're in a high temperature environment. We've entrained hot gases into the spray. The temperature difference between the droplet being cold and the gas being high temperature, we ha expect vaporization. So how do you handle droplet vaporization? Well, if you look at a, a typical fuel, it consists of paraffins, naphthenes, aromatics, olefins. We discussed that already when we were talking about chemistry. And the amount of each of those components um, you can identify. For example, the aromatics might cover a range of carbon number species uh, from 6 to 12 or whatever, uh, and so on. So it's, it's very complicated. And what we do to handle this is to essentially use what's called the discrete multi-component model, where we will pick surrogate species, such as uh, toluene for an aromatic, uh, for the paraffins, the isoparaffins, we might pick isooctane. For the N, uh, we might have, um, uh, you know, N-heptane and so on. So we'd have a set of discrete species that represent this uh, very complex mixture of fuel species in a real fuel. We'll make sure that we have the correct overall liquid density, vapor pressure, surface tension, liquid viscosity, there are all these parameters that are associated with the particular liquid under investigation that we have to match as best we can. Uh, and that's done using uh, surrogate analysis. OK, so now, instead of solving for the entire collection of myriads of species, we can have a reduced number of species. And we'll solve a vapor phase transport equation for each one of those species. So we'll have one equation for toluene, uh, for instance, for the aromatics, and so on. That makes life uh, tractable, right? Rather than trying to, to uh, track all of the species in a real fuel. So here's an example. We have an 18-component um, discrete multi-component model. These are the species that we track. Uh, the yellows are the alkanes, the greens are the aromatics, the blues are the cycloalkanes, and the uh, larger molecules are the PAHs. Uh, it's an 18-component model. We can match the distillation curve uh, of the fuels of interest. For instance, diesel fuel, Jet A, JP8. Here are the boiling temperature versus evaporation fraction. Uh, that tells you essentially which species are vaporizing as a function of temperature. And by choosing the appropriate blend of these 18 species here, we can match the distillation curve. In addition, we can match many of the other physical parameters, uh, surface tension, um, viscosity, density, uh, CH ratio, molecular weight for the various fuels. Some of them we can match better than others, but uh, this is at least a, a, a doable approach to handle a, a real fuel. Just to give an example, here we're injecting gasoline, which is uh, made up in this particular case of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven species uh, that match the distillation curve and the, the physical parameters. Uh, we inject gasoline into this combustion chamber. And we're looking at the situation um, two milliseconds after the start of injection. And what you see is that there's a distribution of species that depends on the vaporization history. So for instance, at the tip of the spray, we see something that looks pretty much like the original gasoline distribution uh, 
of the isopentane, uh, isohexane, and so on, or the species that correspond to the initial gasoline. Whereas if we look back here, we see that only the light ends, the, the, the smaller uh, carbon number species, are located here. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Because those are the ones that vaporized first. They have the most volatile uh, characteristic vaporization. So this is really important because uh, you can now deal with a situation where you have a stratification of species in your combustion chamber. Uh, you have light, more reactive species maybe at this end, or less reactive species, depending on, on, uh, on uh, their distribution. All right, so this is what I wanted to say about spray modeling. The Lagrangian drop or Illyrian fluid discrete drop model is the workhorse approach that you'll find in most commercial engine codes for simulating two-phase flows. And it's even used also in gas turbine uh, flow, uh, simulations and, and other spray combustion applications. Detailed models are available for use in engine CFD uh, codes that describe the effects of the nozzle injector flows, the liquid and gas properties on the spray formation, the drop breakup physics. I say that uh, this is, uh, again, commercial application today. A lot of research is going on looking at large eddy simulation and DNS spray modeling with very high resolution both experimentally and also in CFD model validation. Uh, and I list some of them here. This picture down here shows calculations made by Mario Trujillo's group, uh, which basically are DNS simulations. So the liquid is injected. Uh, you follow the development of the instabilities on the surface of this jet. They eventually lead to droplets. Uh, all of this is done in simulation, right? And you can see that the mesh size is done in the micron level in order to match and track the um, appearance of these uh, particles. Uh, he uses a volume of uh, fluid method. Uh, there are other methods that are used for tracking breakup that uh, are of great interest. One of the interesting things is to see what happens if I change the details of the flow in the nozzle can I influence the breakup of the jet? Here are some references. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, you want to change as little as possible, but if you have to do it, you might have to adjust constants, yeah. We try not to. I mean, the, the model constants, uh, we have papers, uh, one of these papers here by Federico Perini. Um, anyway, he has a paper in which he describes using uh, genetic algorithms to optimize all the constants in a diesel spray model. Uh, and we try to use all of the constants that he's finally uh, proposing. Uh, anyway, you can take a look at some of these references. Another problem that I didn't discuss here, but um, actually we find that uh, 
Um, we need to change the collision model as well. And there's details in, uh, in some of those papers that are referred to there. Yeah, thanks. The, the more, more important effect, though, is the drop gray, which is why I didn't express that. You see, the liquid that's injected here is transferring its momentum to the gas. And if you don't get that right, you basically don't get penetration of the jet right. So it really has to, you have to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, this is a, a practical way to, to get around that issue. Uh, obviously, you know, if you look in the literature, you see people have used uh, certain mesh sizes and they say they get good results. Well, maybe if you if you calibrate your models to get the correct penetration for a certain mesh size, then you can stand there and be happy. But if you want to cover a whole range of sizes, you really need to account for the physics. That's the size of what? Uh, did you do an experiment for this to compare it to the size of what? Oh, yeah, I'm going to show you tomorrow uh, comparisons of experiments and so on um, using these models. Uh, there'll be one that's just inside of this model. Because okay. it's a very interesting piece of conversion. That's where we do it. Okay, so let's meet them tomorrow. Thank you.